Welcome. Sam Pat, my special guest, Sam Pat, thank you so much for joining me on my Toggle Bitcoin podcast show. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right, Sam, um, I'm a friend of Eric Vasquil, and um, he uh, he told me that you're also going to join the uh, Crypto Economic Conference uh, 2020 in Hanoi, Vietnam. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So um, you're one of the speakers. Um, so I checked out your your website and let me maybe screen share this for a moment because it's really interesting what you guys do. Um, so you have a, a a platform. Why don't you why don't you you know give me a, like a me and my listeners a short intro intro how you got into Bitcoin and what is this Open Bazaar about? Yeah. So I got into Bitcoin and I suppose it was uh, late 2012. Um, I was involved in the, um, I guess you could call it libertarian movement. So I got into Bitcoin from the political ideology side. Um, at the time I was working in Washington DC at a, um, a sort of libertarian think tank uh, focusing on technology policy. So I would basically look at the um, proposed regulations and things that uh, policymakers and, and especially the U.S. federal government were doing, and then would write about them to explain usually why they were a bad idea um, from a sort of a, uh, limited government perspective. So I had a few friends that had been talking about Bitcoin for a while, and I never took the time to investigate it. But eventually, I, I saw enough mention of it that I thought, all right, let me check this out. And after I dove into it um, and really investigated it closely for a few weeks, uh, I was sold. Um, <clears throat> so this was late 2012. What I did realize, though, during that, that period, <clears throat> excuse me, was that no one had taken the time, at least no one that I had seen, had taken the time to sort of distill um, down the arguments uh, for Bitcoin and explain really what was going on. It was sort of a hodgepodge of like Bitcoin wiki articles and you know, a few blogs here and there. And so I decided to uh, take a skill set I had, which is writing, and that's what I did. And uh, I wrote one of the first books about Bitcoin called Bitcoin Beginner, uh, which was published in early spring of 2013. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> Got to read yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, and um, that book actually did pretty well. It was, uh, as I said, I think it was the first published book on Bitcoin. It's, it's an ebook, and it's a short thing. It's not a treatise or anything. Um, and then, and then a little bit later, um, Andreas Antonopoulos um, published uh, his book on Bitcoin, which is so much better than mine, and a few other people did. Um, but for a little period there, um, you know, I, I uh, was you know, known as the author of this book, and I got to travel to conferences, uh, all the states and the people in the countries talking to people about Bitcoin, and, and it was, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun, that's how I got started. <clears throat> and then, after, um, I guess, a year and a half or so of this, um, I noticed a, a posting in Bitcoin subreddit talking about dark market. Um, dark market was a marketplace built by Amir Taki, um, with the help of Eric Bosville and a few others at a Toronto hackathon um, in, I think, April of 2014. And their goal was to build effectively a decentralized Silk Road. Uh, the Silk Road had been taken down um, earlier in the fall, the previous fall. And people wanted to build something that allowed for free trade, but couldn't be taken down. <clears throat> that's what they built. Well, I mean, that's what they build a proof of concept for at the Toronto Hackathon called the dark market. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Um, this is a very clear use case for Bitcoin. It just, it really makes a lot of sense. Um, and then I saw uh, this guy, Brian Hoffman, for dark market and created some of the And I really liked his vision for it, which was not focused solely on, um, or, or not focused on the Silk Road-ish side, the, the dark market side, it was focused on building a neutral protocol for peer-to-peer -peer decentralized commerce that anyone could use 
for any reason. It was completely agnostic to the type of trade that was happening on the platform. Um, I really liked that idea. I think it was you know, it's really needed. Um, and it used cryptocurrency, of course. That's you know, the, the tie-in to Bitcoin. Um, so I reached out to Brian a few weeks after it launched, uh, or after he announced he was building this, and I just said, hey, look, um, I'm interested in, in helping. I'm, and actually, I reached, reached out originally because I was planning on watching this development and then writing a book about it. I had been offered to write a newer book um, about Bitcoin by a publishing company. Um, but I, I actually had issues with the way uh, most intellectual property laws decided. I didn't like the way the concept was set up. So I decided, um, and, and Bitcoin had already been written about better than I could, right? And I think at this point, it bears So I thought, I want to write about something new. I want to do it myself. And this, the, the, the emergence of decentralized markets could be a really interesting story. So I reached out to Brian, asked him to do an interview. And it just so happened we both lived in Northern Virginia at the time. Um, so we met up at a Starbucks. I interviewed him for like an hour, an hour and a half, just recorded a bunch of questions about why he was working on it and, and what his vision for it was. And by the time that, that interview was over, I thought, you know, I, I mean, I'm not a programmer. I, I don't know exactly how I can help, but I really want to help this guy make this program uh, project a reality. And so I joined the team, which is just an open source project at the time. There's you know, just a ragtag band of people all around the world just trying to build this decentralized marketplace. And we started to, to get some momentum. A lot of people bought into the vision of having a one place for free trade on the internet. And uh, we grew. And eventually, um, it got to the point where we felt like if we wanted to give this a real go and, and build this thing out properly, that we wanted to uh, seek venture capital funding, make a company and, and, and do it properly. And that's what we did. Uh, so Brian Hoffman, myself, and a third founder, uh, Washington Sanchez from Australia, uh, created a company called OB1. And that was in spring of 2015. And since then, we have been the primary developers and maintainers of the open source, open bazaar marketplace. Um, so that's the story in a nutshell. And uh, if you want, I can give some uh, more details about how open bazaar works and why I, I think. It's yeah, yeah, I'm actually checking it out right now on, on uh, for people on YouTube, uh, you know, so you can check it out. Um, very interesting because uh, there's also a short comment from Andreas Antonopoulos uh, uh, saying on his comment, enjoying the open bazaar beta, trying out simple store for digital goods. So yeah, there's a seems a lot of fans around this platform. Yeah, it's um, it's something that for people who excuse me for for people who find Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies in general valuable. I think there is a lot of overlap for why they would find something like open bazaar value. I mean, the my general um, understanding or, 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 or uh, I guess thesis for why I think decentralized markets themselves are so important um, actually ties in very closely to why decentralized money is so important. So the reason Bitcoin excited me originally and its original purpose is that it allows people to engage in the transfer of electronic value without any third party institution, without any financial institution in play. And that's permissionless money, right? I mean, that, that's really what exactly. it's all about is permissionless money. And so, you know, when you start to think about how important permissionless money is in society and actually step through how people, how you think people would use permissionless money <clears throat> to empower themselves, you pretty quickly run into the issue of, well, where can they spend it? And the problem is, if we have decentralized permissionless money, but it can only be spent on centralized and permissioned platforms, the, the real value proposition it gets 
from the decentralization is kind of just yeah. muted and yeah. uh, non-existent. So you need to have the same censorship resistant permissionless properties of the money in the marketplace. And that's, that's what OpenBazaar does. That's how, uh, that's how it works. And, and the, the way that it works is, uh, and uh, your listeners probably are familiar with most of these technologies, so I don't need to dive deeply, but it's a, it's a peer-to-peer marketplace. It's like BitTorrent. It's like Bitcoin. Um, it's, you know, there's no central point of failure on the network. You have all these nodes that are run by individuals on their own computers or in a, on a virtual private server or something. Um, and they connect directly to each other. There's no, as I said, there's no central point of failure. And so by doing that, by cutting out the middleman, um, you cut out a lot of the problems that the middleman introduces into e-commerce. Um, so some of those are just practical things like fees, right? I mean, you know, everyone listening has probably used Amazon or similar platforms. Um, if you sell something on Amazon, their average take is between 10 and 15%. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Oh, that's yeah. Really high. I mean, oh. it's, it's very high. Um, and other platforms are, are, are higher or lower. Um, but I mean, you know, if, if that becomes the default way that people engage in trade on the internet, just like Google has become kind of the default way people find information, um, you know, there's, I think there's some problems with, with that when they're controlled by one organization so so practically speaking the money side <clears throat> and cutting out that middleman cuts out that fee entirely you go directly between people there is no one in the middle taking that fee um and then there are other things like censorship i mean um again i'll pick on amazon just because they're they're so big and easily uh, uh targeted but um they have i mean if you read amazon's uh terms of service and you read their restricted categories of trade, you know, it's, it's, it's 15 pages long, right? Like there's so much that you can't do on those platforms, um, either because it's not beneficial to the company to do that. So sometimes they restrict stuff just because uh, they don't want that on their platform, like competition wise. Um, <clears throat> so one example of that is Amazon sells a streaming media stick called the Fire Stick. Um, and they don't allow their competitor, the Google Chromecast, to be sold on their platform. Uh, it's just straight up because it benefits them. And then, obviously, on behalf of governments, they censor as well. So entire categories of trade are just not possible on these big e-commerce platforms on behalf of government censorship. So that doesn't exist in the peer-to-peer network. There's no one in between the trades to stop them from happening. And, you know, we society in general needs that sort of freedom for it to flourish. And so that's, uh, that's why I think open design is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, you said there's no single point of failure. Like if we wanted to compare that, or you, you, you saw the broad example with BitTorrent, like, okay, can you go into detail? How does it work? Like, um, um, like compared to, you know, uh, we know the prop, you know, we know it's, it's, uh, I mean, I find it highly scandalous that, that, that Ross Albrecht, uh, who provided the platform and, you know, got a sentence, uh, I don't know how, is it a lifelong sentence for, for what? For I mean, it's worse so than a life sentence. Um, it's a double life sentence plus 40 years and no chance of parole, which is, um, completely egregious. Grotesque. Yeah. 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 So what would be the difference, um, between open bazaar and, um, uh, you know, and you, you mentioned the single point of failure. So there is no single point of failure in Open Bazaar, as you're saying. That's correct. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if this was the intent of your question, but we get this question a lot of like, what's the difference in Silk Road and Open Bazaar? Mm -hmm. and, um, and generally, like, how do you deal with drugs and that sort of thing? Uh, they're, they're completely different. Um, and the reason is Silk Road <clears throat> um, was a marketplace that was centralized. I mean, it was run by mm -hmm. a single person or a group, small group of people with the intent of profiting from mostly illicit activity. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Silk Road was. Um, now, we can have a discussion about the morality of the Silk okay. Road versus the legality. Those are different things. And whether or not, I mean, you know, I've already said Ross Ulbricht's sentence is ridiculous, but 
Um, but that was the goal of what they of what they were doing. That is not the goal of Open Bazaar. Open Bazaar is a agnostic protocol and network for free trade. So it's not centralized in that there is no individual or group of people who are running the network. Um, the developers, my company, Obi Wan, we don't run the network. Anyone who runs a node is a part of the network. Um, it's not run for profit. Um, there is no one, as I said, there's no middleman involved in any of these trades. So we don't profit from it directly. Um, and it's not being run specifically for illicit activity. Uh, again, agnostic to any type of trade, only the people involved in the transactions are the ones who are even aware of a transaction happening or you know have data about the transaction itself. So it's a very different thing altogether. Um, I think generally on the question of whether or not, or, or the question of sort of bad things happening with the platform. The way I view it is, you know, it, it's gonna be reflective of society itself, um, which means the vast majority of transactions are going to be uh, legal and moral transactions. And a small subset of people are going to abuse the technology. And that's true of all technology. And so I, I'm not too bothered by it. Right, but it's sort of the manifestation of, uh, you know, of the of all Austrian economists' dreams, the free market, right? <laughs> Supply and demand. <laughs> I mean, I, so I, I um, just like Eric, I'm really interested in Austrian economics. I don't have nearly the encyclopedic knowledge that he does. Um, but uh, yeah, I view it that way. I think it really, really gets the closest that we've seen to a truly free marketplace. Uh, it really is about the individuals voluntarily interacting with each other to buy and sell as, as they see fit. Um, so, you know, now th that's sort of the, th that's the theory side, right? The implementation side, it's an open question as to whether or not implementation is good enough um, for that, I think, you know, incredibly valuable idea to take root. And that is still unanswered. Um, we have been around now. Open Bazaar 1, the version 1 launched in, I believe, the middle of 2016. And then the version 2 launched around the end of 2017. And that's the, the version we're in now, uh, version 2. And then a mobile application called Haven launched um, August of last year. So it took a long time for us to get to mobile uh, because it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. It's difficult to, to build and mm -hmm. work on a mobile uh, platform. It, can I ask you, uh, Sam, is it downloadable like everywhere or what about like in countries, you know, sanctions? <laughs> it, I, I mean, it's, um, it's hosted on GitHub. Um, right. We have a link that when you click the download link on the openbazaar.org website, for the, the main desktop client. Um, it just downloads it from GitHub. So anyone that has access to GitHub has the ability to run Open Bazaar. Now, there may be countries where, where that is censored itself. Uh, they may be able, be able to get that from you know, a BitTorrent network or something, or using Tor or whatever. Um, but it might be the case that, that in really restricted countries, they attempt to block peer-to-peer -peer network traffic anyway. So I, we built it with the intention that anyone in the world should be able to use it. But I'm not confident in saying, you know, we have not worked with people in every nation to make sure that it's actually usable in their nation. But I do know that it's usable across the world. I mean, it's a very international community of people that use the application. Oh, okay. Um, do, you, do you guys have any um, overview or stats, like what kind of products are traded? Like, is it uh, paintings or whatever? Um, well, it's funny you say paintings, because actually, um, in terms of the amount of vendors on the platform, uh, I think, um, artisans and artists are overrepresented compared to other platforms. Oh, um, it's really uh -huh. neat to see people using this for this, for selling their art directly. Um, there's one in particular artist, uh, Pascal Boyart, um, I think I'm saying that correctly, who makes Bitcoin and, and general um, anti-authoritarian 
uh, artwork who has been using the platform for a long time now. Um, and there's a decent number of people doing that. Um, otherwise, I'd say it's, it's, it's probably closer to more of an Etsy style, uh, which is a lot of individuals and small businesses. There are not a lot that I'm aware of, of larger uh, like retail businesses on there. It's, it's, mostly, uh, it's mostly smaller, smaller uh, stores. Mm -hmm. Okay. What I love about this uh, whole idea and, and platform and uh, is that, you know, Bitcoin is more or less now, you know, in this phase of, um, you know, uh, beyond commodity, of course, you know, or collectible commodity, uh, what do you call it, collectible. Uh, but, you know, it's beyond store of value now. You, you've made it sort of to a utility money, right? Now it's being traded. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I mean that's a whole that's a whole discussion in and of itself um, because you know there there it's an open question what most people involved with Bitcoin view Bitcoin as or view its mm. use or use case as and um, you know it, it has definitely changed over the years from one of uh, medium exchange money primarily to uh, primarily store of value at least among a lot of components and. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's been healthy or not. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical of that, that transition. And I will say like anecdotally in terms of the open, in terms of Open Bazaar, when we first started this in, in 2014, um, there was immense support from the Bitcoin community specifically. And this was originally solely a Bitcoin project. Mm -hmm. And over the years, um, there are a lot of people in the community who have, you know, very directly like rejected the vision of using Bitcoin for for this sort of peer-to-peer uh, you know, -peer commercial activity, um, which is really disappointing to see. And so much so that <clears throat> we were more or less forced to uh, incorporate some other coins, um, which, you know, originally we would not have anticipated doing, um, but we incorporated uh, Bitcoin Cash and Zcash and Litecoin, um, partially because Bitcoin fees became so high uh, in fall of 2017, right when we launched the 2.0, uh, that that was restricting trade. Uh, but partially because other communities were were more welcoming and interested in actually using their their coins for commerce. Um, so the whole space has kind of changed even since Open Bazaar started six years ago now. Um, but it, it, but there are still enough people out there that want this, that have this vision of this. Um, sometimes people call it a circular economy. Yeah, you know, so exactly. Is it funny that you mentioned that now? Because yeah. I was going to ask you, like, what you think about? Because I talked to Parker Lewis yesterday. I was also about this. So people have different opinions on the circ, like on the uh, emergence of circular economies. But go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I think there are still enough people out there that that the, the protocol itself and the network are valuable to a significant number of people. But it's certainly not, I'm speaking personally now, it's certainly not what I had anticipated going into this six years ago because so many people now view the proper use of Bitcoin as not using it. Or, I mean, they'll say that holding it is using it. But, okay. Uh, storing it, uh, anticipating the value will increase and not, not, choosing to put in the effort to uh, actually create and engage in this circular economy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know. I don't know how sustainable that is if that's not how most people view cryptocurrency anymore. Um, we'll see. For the people that care about that, you know, it, it's out there and it is being used, which is, which is great to see. Right. If you look around yourself, like, uh, you know, if you sort of zoom back a little bit and look at all this insanity going on with, uh, you know, geopolitical and macroeconomically, don't you see the parameters sort of giving already the conditions like uh, for that, um, you know, with the negative I, rate I, of interest, inflation, yeah. uh, whatever, uh, pending war or, 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 you know, debt and credit based system of the central banks? Uh, do you see I, I don't know. I, I will say I'm firmly in the I don't know camp. And, okay. and there's a few reasons for that. One 
is I have followed fairly closely the work of um, economists and historians like Robert Higgs, um, who I don't know if you're, familiar, if you're familiar with his work, but he has a theory called like the ratchet effect, <clears throat> excuse me, which means nation states use crises in order to gain more control. Um, right. And that control is usually a ratchet, it's a one way. Uh, when they get those new powers, they don't give them back after the crisis is done. And the crisis, there are various crises that can happen. Some are economic, but often it's war. So yes, the added instability of having you know, wide scale war certainly means that all the funny things that governments are gonna do with their currencies make Bitcoin more attractive, but the ratchet effect of governments trying to increase their control during times of conflict might empower them to just directly go after cryptocurrency. Uh, I'm not at all convinced that we, that cryptocurrencies generally are going to be able to sort of slip under the radar and just take a bunch of control away from nation states because they gain such immense benefit from control of, of, of money and the money supply. So, I don't know. I think the jury's out there. I certainly, it's certainly good that the alternative of cryptocurrency exists. Like, I mean, I'm hugely in favor of it. And I want it to be there so that something is there when, when this funny stuff starts happening. But I'm, I think it completely remains to be seen how, you know, how it's actually going to turn out. And, and, and the vast majority of people in the past, few years who have gotten into cryptocurrency have gotten in due to speculation. Um, I, I think that probably there are positives and benefits to that, you know, reality. One of the uh, or, uh, um, pros and cons, one of the negatives is those people are not ideologically committed to using cryptocurrency if there were some significant off doing so. Um, and so if nation states do start rating, rattling sabers about this and people think, oh, well, my speculative investment is not going to pay off now because it's not going to be legal, um, then all this speculation and the price that we've seen due to speculation is just going to crash through the, through the floor. So even if the use of cryptocurrencies becomes even more obvious, uh, you know, it becomes even more powerful to have uh, cryptocurrency or to have an alternative economy outside control of nation states. At the same time, the utility is increased because of the crackdowns. The speculative investment side is destroyed. And so, you know, for people who really care, that probably doesn't matter. But the price, I'm not convinced it's, it's going up. Um. What do you think about the monetary properties, the unique monetary properties of Bitcoin then? You know, there's some monetary properties that are totally unique uh, in, within Bitcoin, with it be the absolute scarcity, um, the, the, the yeah, difficulty I mean, adjustment, the stock to flow ratio, you know, all these things. The scarcity, um, I, I, I don't know if the scarcity is really that absolute. Uh, I mean, I know the way that it's set up now we should be able to understand exactly when things are um, when coins are issued um, but that is a sort of social that is a social consensus um, and that doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that that's always going to exist um, that can change people's minds can change so we I mean this is this is it's still kind of an experiment in the sense that we've never had money that is digital and that is defined by a social consensus of people running software. Uh, the first decade looks promising, right? It, it looks like we're not going to change the underlying properties that significantly, which I think is good. But I don't, I'm not confident in saying the next decade or the next few decades that we know, you know that we're going to end up with true scarcity. Um, I agree that it's that it's a positive, but I, I don't know that it's permanent. Yeah. 
because uh, I'm thinking, you know, of the economic incentivization and I mean, who wants their money to be diluted? Uh, you know, so it's this game theory again uh, with the economic incentivization, incentivization in general. So uh, even, uh, um, uh, you know, a small minority, uh, you know, running their own full nodes and, and, and understanding, you know, the monetary properties. It's just not, you know, a social illusion, but the monetary properties that are sort of set in stone um, uh, makes it logical to hold on to and not to have it diluted through, you know, uh, um, the dissolution of, uh, of this social consensus, as you say, you know, that's what I'm trying to yeah. get to. Yeah. Uh, thus far, I think that's that, that has that has held and uh i certainly hope it does mm -hmm. um it might be the case that you know it it, it is a fact though um i mean you know nation states are not going to give up their control over, over money without a fight long term right. and uh you know if they do something like a 51 percent attack they can change whatever rules they want well mm. yeah i i, I Long term, I, I I don't know is the answer. Right. Short term, I think I think you're right. Thus far, the incentives have have have, have proven to align things uh, well enough to give it good, decent monetary property. But but I admit to being um, not as strong a the use case of Bitcoin that appeals most to me is the fact that it is the permissionless exchange of electronic value. That that is the thing that matters most to me. Um, people being able to store their value electronically is just not as uh, as important to me. So yeah, that's that's, gotcha. that's mm -hmm. so uh, let's go back to this um, uh, crypto economic conference that's taking place in Hanoi. What what is what is your role there? Well, what would you what would you talk about? Yeah, so Eric invited me because he wanted someone to give an overview of the decentralized market space, broadly speaking. Um, and that's basically my role. I'm, I'm going to go down there and, and just talk about where we're at with, with decentralized markets and, uh, I, and, and also why I think they're important from sort of a, an economics uh, perspective. And... I think Eric, uh, well, I, I mean, I can't speak for him. You, you could ask him, but I think he, he likes to pick out people who uh, have maybe somewhat contrarian views to how like most people view the, the economics of Bitcoin. Uh, and I, I probably fit into that category. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's probably it. All right. Okay, so um, let me ask you uh, finally, um, what, what's what is the roadmap for Open Bazaar? Like, do, do you have a do you have a roadmap, like a vision, like do you, for yourself, a perspective? Yeah. The 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 biggest thing that we had focused on in recent years is is not having Open Bazaar be limited to the desktop, um, because so much of activity now happens on on mobile devices. We we felt it was just vital. Uh, to get it off of being a download only application. So that was, that was achieved with, partially achieved with Haven, which is the name of the OpenBazaar mobile application, uh, which is out on, on iOS and Android. Um, and moving forward, one of the highest priorities is to get OpenBazaar working on the um, web. So yeah, if you click that link, gethaven.app, uh, it'll it'll show you the you know, oh. where you how you can download and and get oh, yeah, it. okay. Mm -hmm. um, but but getting it on the web. So instead of needing to download the application, you'll be able to just go to a site or download from GitHub, whatever, and in your browser, be able to engage and trade with other people just like you would uh, as if you downloaded it. Um, and then beyond that, there's a few there's a <laughs> There's a very long wish list of things that we have wanted to do over the years, but had to focus on sort of the core functionality first. Um, one of those is privacy coins. Um, right now, we do have Zcash incorporated, 
but it does not use their shielded transactions. It's only transparent. So it's as much privacy as Bitcoin, which is not a ton. Um, and so we want to get shielded Zcash in. We want to get Monero integrated. There's been some people in the Monero community working on that for, for a while now. Um, and uh, off the top of my head, those are the things that we kind of want to do for Open Bazaar in the short to medium term. Um, there are some long-term things that we want to do, like auctions. Um, it's never you never had the ability to do auctions on Open Bazaar. It's just sale at a certain price, and we wanted to do that. Um, we wanted to create like location dependent stuff, ge geographic, uh, incorporate uh, geography into uh, into the marketplace. Right now, you can sort of ad hoc add your location, but we really want to allow it. I mean, the the vision of Open Bazaar is you know the place online for free trade using cryptocurrencies, and an important part of that is being able to make it like a Craigslist where you're able to find people local to you who want to buy or sell things using cryptocurrency. And that just isn't really possible in Open Bazaar right now without hacky things. So moving us to that model where Open Bazaar is, you know, if you want to buy or sell anything in your local area with other people who want to use cryptocurrency and care about privacy, you use Open Bazaar. Mm -hmm. With the improvement of privacy and, you know, fungibility, all these, you know, I'm not the techie guy, you know, Schnorr's, whatever, Taproot, all these uh, things that are being uh, tremendously worked on with, with incredible speed, uh, Lightning Network. Do you think this, this is uh, going to be, you know, a big thing uh, in connection with Open Bazaar or your app? Uh, I mean, I don't know. We, we like, the privacy side is, is, is really important. Um, and so, you know, we've, um, for example, we allow people to use Tor. It's not on by default, but people can, uh, uh use them bizarre over Tor. Um, these other, you know, improvements as they come along, you know, we intend to in incorporate them. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't know about things like the lightning network and some of the other specific ones, how, how they'll be integrated. Um, the Lightning Network model, well, I don't need to go into the details, but IPFS is, is what Open Bazaar is built on, uh, the interplanetary file system. And we built it on that for the second version specifically so that people didn't have to run their Open Bazaar nodes all the time, which they did have to do in the first Because it's peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, if the node's not running, you're not connected to the network. You're not engaged with trade with so the second version, we built on IPFS so that people could still engage in trade, even when they're not um, But everyone controls their own keys, the vital aspect of how the internet works, and uses multi sig for But you cannot do, in the past at least, it has not been possible to effectively use the binding network and hold your own keys and join the network and leave the network whenever you want. Uh, or there's significant risk. So it's, it might be the case that, that as Lightning Network uh, evolves, that that problem will be figured out and we can incorporate it into the bar. But as it stands right now, it's not a simple thing for us to integrate the Lightning Network because the way it works is sort of incompatible with trade flow. All right. Can you just check your mic, um, Sam, for a second? Um, it's like going down and up. Um, Maybe it's a connection, not sure. Otherwise, I can hear you pretty clearly. It just sometimes drops out a scratchy noise. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I, I can't see anything that's changed on mine. All right, okay. So, um, yeah, uh, any final thoughts, uh, Sam? I uh, really enjoyed your, our talk. It was, I really loved the, you know, the whole model, the, bit, the concept behind it. Um, any, any other idea, uh, like sources people can go to besides uh, openbazaar.org, is that it? And gethaven.app. Yeah, those are the primary two. I mean, if you're interested in using it on your computer, go to openbazaar.org and download it. It is free. There is no cost. If you're interested in using it on your phone, get haven.app, download it, or you can just search for the word haven in, in either of your app stores. Um, and I'll just put out a plug. Uh, this is an open source project. It has been since the beginning. It's MIT licensed, meaning anyone can use it for any time. 
And we love having contributors. We have a Slack group with thousands of people where people can come and ask questions, build on top of what we have. A small community of people who build things on top, like search engines and tools to host vendor stores and whatnot. So it's a, it's a friendly community of people who are interested in cryptocurrency and sort of decentralization technology broadly. If they interest you, I highly encourage you to, to uh, check it out. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time, Sam. And hope I'm I'm gonna try to make it to uh, Vietnam, Hanoi in what is it? End of February, beginning of March, something. So. Yes, I think it's uh, I think it starts February twenty third. Yeah, and looking forward to you know maybe even a personal talk or a one to one uh, personal face to face interview uh, that would be you know quality wise even better. So, Sam, thank you so much and hope to talk to you soon again. All right. Thanks. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good day. Hey, so what you guys think about this really interesting talk with Sam Pat? Um, I'm a total advocate, you know, of, of freeing up the, the market. Um, yeah, the monetary root layering of Bitcoin. And um, yeah, I'm a huge advocate of this because this brings, you know, um the the real usage the real utility uh in trading you know in in free market activities uh buying selling you know uh, uh censorship resistant decentralized open uh neutral uh all these you know properties um with the you know hardest scarcest and um best money we've ever created in human history um and that is Bitcoin. So yeah, let me know what you think. Give me your feedback, your questions. Uh, give me a follow. I would really appreciate if you share this uh, interview, this podcast, leave me a positive review on any podcast platform um, and follow me on, on Twitter. My Twitter handle is uh, Kevin Devani or write me an email to hello at the total connector.com or KD at Kevin so I'm still looking for a sponsor in order to go, you know, live to the conferences, make one-to-one, one-on-one, face-to-face personal interviews with all these experts, speakers, Bitcoiners. So um, if you're an ethical sponsor, please get in touch with me. And uh, I want to go to, you know, uh, to these Bitcoin conferences, whether it be in Vietnam, San Francisco, uh, or whatever, and, um, you know, bring you really high quality content. All right. That's it. Have a great day. The Total Connector signs off. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.